My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. We're about to end our studies in end-time events. Uh, this you can see is message number 14. And I've only skimmed the surface, so I could take uh, twice that many messages, more than that, trying to cover everything. But I've tried to give you the basics uh, of things. Hopefully you'll be able to put things together, and, and maybe before we're finished, we'll look at the chart one more time so that you can work your way through your chart and try to understand in your mind. You'll never get it all, or you're better than, than I am. I don't think you can get it all. It's, it's, it's really, it's very deep. The, the, you cannot just go to the book of Revelation or the gospel of Matthew, but the prophets, it's throughout Scripture. Matter of fact, I heard David Jeremiah say the other day, I was listening to something on him, and he was actually talking about this, and David Jeremiah, when he went to Dallas Seminary, Dwight Pentecost was one of the professors, and I have one of his books, and I use Dwight Pentecost, and he said, Dr. Pentecost said that there's more in Scripture concerning the kingdom of God than any other subject. It's even more than salvation. So everything really is about God and His kingdom. And Jesus told us to pray, and, and I pray this quite often, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as I've been praying about that, I think about it in a couple of ways. I think about, first of all, I think about God's kingdom in my own life. I don't know that I can really pray for the kingdom here upon earth if God doesn't have a rule in my own life. And so I've been praying almost daily. Uh, it's, it's a part of my prayer. I find myself thinking over this over and over again and, and analyzing my life and trying to determine, is, is Jesus king of my life? Is he king of my decisions? Is he king of my will and who I am? And I believe that I have an obligation as a follower of Christ to pray daily for Christ's kingdom to come in my life. But then also, Jesus said that I am to pray for God's kingdom to come, for his will to be done in this earth or upon this earth as it is in heaven. Now, some people believe that we're already in the kingdom. And if this is the kingdom, then we're in trouble. That's just my opinion. I don't see Jesus reigning as king upon this earth. I see a world as a, as a whole rebelling more and more against him. Personally, the way I interpret Scripture and the way I understand prophecy, we, we're not getting better, we're getting worse. We're, we're getting closer and closer to the tribulation period. We're getting closer and closer to the time when, when Christ has to return and actually judge the world for its sin. That's not a, a popular thing to say, but that's reality if you and I will be serious about the way that we see the world going on around us. But we are to be praying. We are to be seeking. That is the ministry of Twin Oaks. The ministry of Twin Oaks is for God's kingdom to come, for God's will to be done, and we're involved in that. So what does it mean when we talk about the kingdom of God? Just exactly what is the kingdom of God? Well, I believe the Scripture teaches the kingdom of God can be viewed in three different aspects. First of all, the Bible teaches me of what we might call the, the eternal kingdom of God. The Bible says that God is the Alpha and the Omega, which is the first letter. It's A and Z in the Greek alphabet. He's the beginning and the end. God, the Bible says, starts out with Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. So we know that God not only created the universe, but we know that God existed before the universe. The Bible says that he's eternal. And I believe everything that there is, this world, the universe, even hell, is under the domain of God and his kingdom. I believe God is the king over everything. That doesn't mean everything necessarily is submitted to his will, but I believe that God is king. He's the creator, the sustainer of the universe. Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. I believe that God gives us the breath that we breathe. I believe that God is everything. Two or three verses of scripture about the eternal kingdom of God. Psalm 29.10 says, the Lord setteth king forever. Psalm 103.19 says, The Lord hath prepared His throne in the heavens, and His kingdom ruleth over all. 
And the Apostle Paul said this as he wrote to Timothy, Now unto the King Eternal, which means he's always been king. He's always been king. He'll always be king. Now unto the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And so I believe everything there is is a part of God's eternal kingdom. I believe that God created this universe, the Bible says, for his own glory. The stars, the sky, us, human being, earth, everything is for the glory of God. And so therefore, everything should give its allegiance to God. And the Bible says one day everything will give its allegiance to God. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, if you will. Jesus is King to the glory of God the Father. So there's the eternal kingdom of God. But then Jesus also said this in Luke chapter 17, verse 21. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So there's an eternal kingdom of God, but there's also a spiritual kingdom of God. And when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, Paul says in the book of Colossians, we are delivered from the kingdom of darkness and we are translated or brought into Christ's kingdom of light. I'm a part of God's eternal kingdom. I'm a part of God's spiritual kingdom because I've accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. When Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, most commentaries say this can be interpreted one of two ways. One, Jesus was saying, the kingdom of God is right now in your midst, speaking of himself. John preached this, John the Baptist, and then Jesus preached. This was Jesus' first message. You know what his first message was? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the first message Jesus preached. Meaning what? That he, the king, or the Christ, Christ is not a name, Christ is a title. Jesus Christ means, Christ is a title which means the anointed one of God. If you will, really, you could say the king of God, God's chosen king. That's really in many ways what the word Christ or the title Christ means. God's anointed one to be king over all that there is. The Old Testament, they didn't say Christ, they said Messiah. And the Jews, the other day I was studying on this and I got caught up in something and I spent most of an afternoon studying on this, and really, I, I, I went home and I told Tammy, I said, I think that I, I understand the Jews and their reaction to Christ when he was here, Jesus when he was here, a little bit more than I did before. You see, the Jews have been taught of their life, and through the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and, and Zechariah and Zephaniah and Hosea and all of Daniel, all of these prophets spoke of the kingdom of God that was to come. And they believed in their heart. God promised to David that he would have an heir that would set upon his throne. They believed in that and they were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Or they were waiting for the coming of God's king that would establish a kingdom of justice and peace upon the earth. And when you consider the fact that they were under Roman oppression, who could blame them for that? If you were being afflicted the way they were being afflicted, by the Romans, then you would be longing for it as well. Matter of fact, the other day as I was reading on this out of one Jewish website, it said that every young Jewish woman during the days of Jesus and before him prayed that she would give birth to the Messiah. The Jews prayed three times a day that God would send the Messiah, that God would send his king to, to restore the prosperity, the peace to Israel. And thus from Israel to the rest of the world. The book of the Bible, the book of Ezekiel talks about that. The book of Ezekiel talks about God one day actually establishing a, a temple in Jerusalem. During the, there, was going to be a, there was a temple built by Solomon, and then it was destroyed, and then Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple. And then during the tribulation period, the Bible says there's going to be another temple built. But then there's going to be a fourth temple that is going to be built on that site in Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom, during the kingdom of Christ. And the book of Ezekiel teaches us that, that, that the Holy of Holies will be the throne of Christ, the throne of God, and that all the world will go to Jerusalem to worship God. Matter of fact, I can't remember which one of the prophets said it. Forgive me, but he said, in that day, ten Jews will grab the skirt of one Jew saying, take us to Jerusalem. The whole world will want to, during the millennial kingdom, to worship 
Jesus the King. The Jews looked for that, and they struggled with Jesus. And I'll tell you two or three reasons why they struggled with Jesus. Number one, they believed that the king would be of human descent and not necessarily deity. Now, we understand that Jesus is the God-man. He's God on the inside, and he was man on the outside. We have the advantage through New Testament teaching to understand that, but the Jews could not understand that. They could not conceive that God would have a son and that he was going to send his son. And so therefore, any time there was a reference to Jesus being the son of God, to them that was blasphemy, and they didn't even look for that. They looked for a son of David. And matter of fact, if you read especially in the Gospel of Matthew, which was written about the kingdom primarily to Jews, the Jews, were, oftentimes people were crying out to Jesus, calling him, Son of David, have mercy upon us. When Jesus, the triumphal entry, when he's coming into Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna, Son of David. They're, they were welcoming what they thought their descendant of David, who would be their earthly king. And so therefore, when Jesus was ever, as I said, referred to as the Son of God, to them it seemed like blasphemy. They believed because they understood from the Old Testament prophets that the temple one day would become the center of the world. That all the world would want to come to, to Jerusalem to worship there at the temple. And then when Jesus would say, destroy this temple in three days, I'll build it again. They're like, destroy the temple? What are you talking about? That's blasphemy to them. You're going completely contrary. They, and of course, we know that Jesus was talking about his physical body. But they couldn't understand all of that. And so they, and most of all, they believed, they believed that the law was their way to God. And so therefore they could not conceive that they needed a Savior and they never once thought about the, the Messiah being a Savior. The Messiah was going to be a king to them. So when Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, it's in your midst, it's here Right now, the king is here. Wake up, is what he's saying to them. Wake up. I'm offering to you the kingdom of God right now, a spiritual kingdom. And he also meant by that, it's not only am I in your midst, the kingdom of God is within your heart. Why do I pray almost daily, thy kingdom come, thy will be done? It's because I want Jesus to rule in my heart. Currently, I'm reading uh, one of the little books I'm reading right now is by Andrew Murray, and it's on it's a book on humility. And so I've been reading that book on humility, and as Andrew Murray back in the 1800s is trying to explain that, and he's in, he's he's stressing the importance of coming to the point to where we empty ourselves of self so that God can actually take the throne of our lives and rule and reign. And our biggest problem is ourself. Our biggest enemy is our self and our own selfishness and pride and ego and things like that. And God can't rule on a throne like that. And so I've been praying daily because I want the king, I want, I want Jesus to be king of my life. And sometimes I feel like I get closer to it than others, to be honest with you. There's an eternal kingdom of God. There's a spiritual kingdom of God. But the Jews believed, and many believe, and I believe, that God one day is actually going to establish an earthly kingdom here. Now look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, I want you to notice one thing. First of all, the reference to a thousand years. A thousand years, just make a mental note of it, how many times it's made reference to. Bound him a thousand years, verse 3, and cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till or until the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Now some people believe, uh, some of my brethren believe that the thousand years is just a symbolic. It doesn't, not a literal thousand years. What's hard for me to understand is that there seems to be a beginning and an end to it, which says to me it's a specific period of time. There's a beginning when Satan is bound, 
And there's an ending to it when he's released again. And I'll explain to you a little bit more in a moment why it's so significant that he'll be released again. Verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, that is the Antichrist, neither received his image, neither received his mark, 666, upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And so part of the people that's going to be in this kingdom are people that accepted Jesus Christ during the tribulation period, and no doubt they were actually put to death. So for them to be there means the thousand years. It, has, it can't be now. It has to come after the tribulation period. Verse 5, But the rest of the dead live not until the thousand years, there it is again, were finished, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him. There it is again. A thousand years. And then verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And the Bible says for just a short season. Six times there's a reference to a thousand years. Why a thousand years? I don't know. I've looked at every commentary that I can look at. Nobody has touched it. I'll give you my little interpretation of it. I don't know that don't, you know, you can't take this to the bank. But the Bible, Peter says, a day as if a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day with the Lord. I believe that perhaps this thousand years is, is a representation to us just one day in the life of God if mankind had not rebelled against him. A thousand years is a long time thousand years is nothing to God and really hang on to that it's really it's amazing that there's going to be a thousand years of peace and then at the end of it there's going to be people that's going to actually rebel against God so how does all of that come into play well we're going to study it here as we continue on let me tell you just a little bit of the sequence and and boy we could do a whole series just on the millennial kingdom if we tried to dig into all the the prophets and all that they had to say about this millennial kingdom but let me just share with you two or three things. First of all, the Bible says one of the, the first things that's going to happen is that Satan is going to be bound in the abyss, the bottomless pit, during the 1,000 years. Wouldn't you like to go for 1,000 years without Satan? Wouldn't you like to go one week? Wouldn't you like to go one day without Satan? You know, apparently Satan has much more influence upon this world than we realize because part of what's going to make it this millennial kingdom and where Christ can rule and reign is that Satan is going to be bound in this bottomless pit with a chain during the 1,000 years secondly it says verse 4 again I saw thrones plural and they that sat on them, and judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them beheaded for the witness. Da, da, da. It goes on through. Look at the end of that verse. And they lived. Notice. They lived. Meaning once they were dead, but now they're alive. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Which means what? Christ is reigning. They're reigning. They're alive again. They're with him during this 1,000 year time period. One of the great things about this millennial kingdom is that Jesus Christ is actually during that 1,000 years, he's going to actually be here on earth and he's going to rule and reign. Zechariah chapter 14 says that when Jesus comes at his second coming, that his feet will actually touch the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is the same place where Jesus ascended back up to his father, Acts chapter 1. Jesus is coming right back to that same spot. The Bible says that when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, it will split open like a great earthquake. And he will actually set foot here upon this earth. Jesus will not be in heaven during that 1,000 years. He will be here upon this earth. And he will rule, the Bible says. Let me read to you something Isaiah said. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and his kingdom to order it, to establish it, 
with judgment and with justice and henceforth forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Jesus actually, the Bible says, the government of the world will be upon his shoulder. During that day, it will not be a democracy. It will be a theocracy. What is a theocracy? Theos is the Greek word for God. A theos is when God rules and reigns. God created this universe to be ruled with a theocracy. But man decided that he knew more than God, and so we think that we have a right to a democracy or a republic, whichever you would choose to say on that. But it will be a theocracy because Christ will, will rule and reign, and not only Christ, the Bible indicates that David will be resurrected along with all the other Old Testament saints. David will co-reign under Christ. The, Jesus said to the apostles that they would sit upon the thrones and judge the nation of Israel. Jesus or Paul said that the church would be a part of this. So in other words, what's going, who's going to be there? It's going to be everyone from Abel. You remember Cain killed Abel? It's going to be everyone from Abel to the, to the individual living that accepts Christ during the tribulation period, which includes us, the church. It'll be the Old Testament saints. It'll be the tribulation saints. It'll be the people that are Christians today. And most importantly, it'll be our Savior, Jesus Christ. Not only will Christ rule and reign, let me read to you something out of the book of Hosea. On that day I will, listen to this, this is fascinating. On that day I will make a covenant with all the wild animals and the birds of the sky and the animals that scurry along the ground so that they will not harm you. The animals will be at peace. Matter of fact, Isaiah says two or three interesting things on this. Isaiah says in Isaiah 65, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. If you had a bunch of sheep, would you want, what would you do if you saw the wolf coming into the field? Well, you know what would happen. Because why, why would the wolf do that? Because the, the wolf is under the curse, like the rest of the animals. The lion, it says, shall eat straw like an oxen. And Isaiah 11 says this. This is probably the most remarkable thing. It says a little child will be able to play at a den of snakes and there'll be no fear. I don't think I'd want my child to have a snake as a play thing, would you? During that time period, nobody will worry about it. Why? They will be at peace. Not only that, will there be peace with the animals? The Bible says there'll be peace among the nations. God says, I will remove all weapons of war from the land, all swords and bows, so that you can live unafraid in peace and safety. Isaiah says they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. What is a plowshare? I didn't know that. I looked up the other day to try to, I've always heard that all my life, a plowshare, and I thought, what is a plowshare? A plowshare is that little piece of metal, especially in those days, a plow was made primarily out of wood. Metal was so scarce, and a plowshare would be that one little piece of metal that they would put at the piece of that wood plow, and that one piece of sharp metal would be what would actually cut the sod open. And a man won't, take a, a man won't have a sword. A man will take his sword and use it for productivity, to grow crops with a plowshare. The Bible also says that there will be great prosperity and longevity of life. Let me read to you what it says in Isaiah 35. Even the wilderness and desert shall be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. Yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing of joy. The deserts will become as green as the mountains of Lebanon, as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon. There the Lord will display his glory and the splendor of all our God. Amen. The whole earth will blossom. You know, many years ago, a man by the name of Isaac Watts wrote a song, and we sing it at Christmas time, but I'm not for sure that he wrote it for a Christmas song. You know what it is? Joy to the world. We think joy to the world is a Christmas song. Joy to the world is actually not about the first coming of Christ. It's about the second coming of Christ. Joy to the world. Let earth receive her king. No more let thorns and thistles grow, nor what if something infests the ground, however it goes, you know. That's, that's a time about this, this time of great prosperity, of rejoicing upon the earth. Here's one of the most interesting things about that time period. It says in the book of Isaiah chapter 65, I think it's verse 20, that if somebody dies at the age of 100, everybody will say, oh, what a shame, they were so young. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? 
which tells us it can't be heaven because there'll be no death in heaven. That statement will not even be made about heaven. It must mean another time period. When would that time period be? Well, it's going to be during this millennial kingdom. I believe in many ways, if you will, maybe this will help you get it in your mind. I believe that in many ways, it is God revealing to man what life could have been like if man had not rebelled against God. God's going to really, in many ways, restore it back to, the, to Eden, if you will, just to reveal us to us how good God could be if only we would have just followed him. Actually, let me share with you quickly two or three reasons why I believe God will establish this earthly kingdom. Number one, I believe that it is a reassurance of God's faithfulness. Why do I say that? The Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie or that he should repent of anything. God never makes a mistake. God never says, I wish I hadn't done that. Nor does God ever make a promise that he doesn't keep. That's good to know. The Bible says all the promises of God are yes, meaning that they are certain. God doesn't just throw a promise out like we do sometimes, you know. Somebody says, well, you do so and so, and we oh, yes, I'll do that. And we're thinking, I'm not going to do that. But God doesn't, he's not that way. Anything God says that he does, the Bible says he swears by his own name. Anything God says he'll do, God will do. That's good to know. What is God going to do? What has he said he'll do? Well, I'll tell you one thing God said that he will do that he's never done yet. God promised Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12 and then chapter 13, when God called Abraham and to begin the Jewish nation so that eventually God could give birth to the Messiah and, and save the world, when God first began to do this and he told Abraham, he said, I'll give you a great nation and through your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then God also told him, he said, I will give you a portion of land that will be your inheritance forever. What is that portion of land? Well, the Jews to this day have never possessed it. Today you go to the UN and they'd be arguing over the west bank of the Jordan. They need to be arguing over the west bank of the Euphrates. That's how big the piece of land is that God has promised. God gave the boundaries of it, how far that it would go and extend. The Jews have never completely possessed what God promised to them, nor have they continuously possessed what even a little bit that they had. They would conquer part of it, and then another nation would take it away, and they'd conquer it again, and another nation would take it away, and they're just going to be going back and forth, back and forth. But God made a promise to Abraham, the land that he would possess. God has never fulfilled that promise yet, which tells me God is still going to fulfill that promise. It's called the Abrahamic covenant. God made a promise to David. God told David that there would be an heir of his that would sit upon his throne. Let me read to you something that the angel said to to Mary on the night that Jesus, well, when the angel, excuse me, first told Mary that, that she was going to give birth to the Son. Let me see if I can find it here. Give me just a second. I should have marked it. I apologize to you. He promised her that he, that she would, all right, here it is. Thank you, Father. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and thou shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. Referring what? To his deity. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Jesus is both the Son of God and the Son of Man. And listen. He shall reign over the house of Jacob, which is Israel, forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Is Jesus ruling over the Jews? No. Not to this point he hasn't. John 1.11 says he came into his own and his own received him not. The Jews as a nation up to this point have yet to embrace Jesus as their king, as their Messiah. God made a promise to David that he would have an heir. God's going to fulfill that. God made a promise to the nation of Israel that he would give them a new heart to where they would love God, Jeremiah chapter 31, and no one would even have to tell them to love God. They would just instinctively love God. They've not yet done that. But God is going to fulfill all of that. A second reason I think the purpose of this kingdom is a reward for our service and sacrifice today. In Revelation chapter 5, when the saints are singing to God, 
You know what part of the song they sing to Jesus is this. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. One day we'll reign on the earth. But the last reason, I think the most significant reason, please pay attention in verse 7, Revelation 20. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Now, come here with, in your mind with me a second. What's happening? At the initiation of the, of the millennial kingdom, Satan is going to be bound. His, his, his influence is going to be restricted so that there can be peace and prosperity and love and, and brotherhood. No, no war, no need for a sword, anything. But then the Bible says, immediately after that thousand years, he is going to be released for a short season. He's going to go out into the world, and he's going to deceive the nations, and the nations are going to, many of the nations are going to march against Jerusalem. Now come here with me. What does this mean? How can this happen? How can, how can saints march against God? Well, they won't. Well, who will then? If we had time to look at it, and we don't, Matthew chapter 25 talks about uh, the parable of the sheep and the goats. You ever heard of that? Separ you know, have you heard of saying sometimes, you know, I've got to separate the sheep from the goats? Have you ever heard that little saying? That saying is actually biblical, believe it or not. The Bible says that one day, that at the end of the tribulation period, Christ is going to bring together the nations of the world, and he's going to judge the nations of the world at the end of the tribulation period. Among those nations, there will be many who have rebelled against God, and they will be judged, they will be put to death, they will be resurrected at the second resurrection, and stand before God at the great white throne judgment. But there are going to be others that actually, there are going to be some people that's actually going to live through the tribulation period and not die. They're going to be Christians that's actually going to make their way through the tribulation period in physical bodies. So let's suppose, let's suppose that you've got this, this, this boy, this, this young man that, that has become a Christian during the tribulation period and, and he enters into the millennial kingdom in a physical body and you got him and he's in a physical body and you know, you know he's 20 years old. Think there for a minute. He's 20 years old. He's got a thousand years to live. And then he sees this little gal over here and she's 19 years old and she's a Christian and she goes into the millennial kingdom in her physical body. What do you think is going to happen? Same thing that's going on today. They'll be married. They'll get married. There'll be marriage during that time period. And if there's marriage, then there's probably going to be what? Babies. There'll be thousands, maybe millions, it's a thousand years. How many babies can be born in a thousand years if people are going to live over a hundred years old? Great, day. Eh? So there'll be thousands of babies born. The world will be populated during that thousand years. And everything will be good. But the problem's going to be this. Now, in all of those, please listen. Not all of those babies who grow up to be maybe parents themselves and grandparents, thousand years, not all of them are going to know the Lord. You know, just being born in a Christian family doesn't make you a Christian. Just being in a church environment doesn't make you a Christian. Just going to Sunday school doesn't make you a Christian. Just not saying curse words in front of your mom and dad doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. Just being good doesn't make you a Christian. You know, most kids, most of the time, are pretty good here at church. Most of them, most of the time. And while they're in this protected environment, many of these children will act like, you won't know, you won't know who is and who isn't. Kind of like it is now, sometimes, to tell you the truth. You won't know who is and who isn't a Christian. But when Satan is released, and he begins to attack their hearts, those who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, their heart, the sinful heart, will take over. And they'll rebel against God. Jesus said this. Ex 
except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man or a person be born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Being good does not make somebody a part of the kingdom. Only the new birth by the Holy Spirit, which makes a new creation, that's how somebody becomes a part of the kingdom of God. Now I want to ask you a question in closing today. Are you a part of the kingdom of God? You see, the Bible tells us that there are two kingdoms in this universe. Colossians 1.13. There are two kingdoms in this universe. One is a kingdom of darkness. And 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that God is, or Satan is the God of this kingdom. There's a kingdom of darkness. And the Bible says there's a kingdom of light that is ruled by Jesus Christ. We're not born automatically in the kingdom of light. Just having Christian parents doesn't make us automatically born in the kingdom of light. The Bible teaches us that we are born actually in the kingdom of darkness. Because we're born with that heart. And if you've been, ever been a parent and raised even little kids, you understand that. That, you know, you don't have to teach your child to be selfish or anything like that. It's just a part of human nature. And then as you go on through life, it manifests itself more and more. And in order for us to be delivered from the kingdom of darkness to be made a kingdom of light, something dramatic has to happen. Jesus says we have to be born again. What does it mean to be born again? The Bible teaches us, it says that we are dead in our senses, in our sins, excuse me. We're dead in our relationship to God. When we're a part of the kingdom of darkness. Many people who are part of the kingdom of darkness don't know God and don't want to know God. I don't want anything to do with God. Right? You recognize that if you look at the world, you see that. I don't want anything to do with God. I want to do my own thing. And the Bible says that Jesus had to pay the price on the cross to deliver us from this kingdom of darkness and to translate us into the kingdom of light if you will it's like there's a great chasm between the two and a man tries to get over there by his good works and he falls short he tries to get over by every other means and he just can't make it there's only one way across that chasm you know what it is it's a cross it's the cross of Jesus Christ the cross of Jesus Christ spans that chasm so that we can be delivered, translated, the Bible says, from this kingdom of darkness into Christ's kingdom of light. I am happy to say today that I'm a part of God's eternal kingdom. I am happy to say today that I'm a part of His spiritual kingdom. I'm happy to say one day I will be a part even of His earthly kingdom. Jesus is king as far as I'm concerned. Have you ever been born again? Have you ever been delivered from the kingdom of darkness and made a part of the kingdom of light? You say, what would I do? I don't even know what to do, Pastor Terry. Here's what you got. It's just this simple. But please listen carefully. And I'm going to close. Number one, you have to come to the point to where, and the Spirit is, does this inside of us. This Holy Spirit, when the Word of God is preached... The Holy Spirit says to us, this is truth. This is you. That's what he said to me. This is you. The Bible says we have to acknowledge the fact that we are sinners. That we're not worthy to be in the kingdom of light. We recognize we're in the kingdom of darkness. You know the song that the kids did there a while ago, signed out. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that what? saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That man understood how to be translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. 
We have to acknowledge that we are sinful in the sight of God. Secondly, we have to believe that Jesus is the only way to bridge that chasm. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There's no other way. And we have to acknowledge that. We have to receive that. And thirdly, you know, here's the crazy thing. I believe that there are people that's over in the kingdom of darkness and they acknowledge the fact that they're sinful and they acknowledge the fact that Jesus is the way, but they've never made the journey. So they're still here in the kingdom of darkness. They're still doomed until they make a choice of their will to follow the way of the cross and to come to Christ. I want to invite you to come to Christ today. I pray for you. I pray for you this morning on my face in this room. I don't even know who you are. I don't even know how it's going to work. God, you know. I prayed in my office a few minutes ago during Sunday school. I prayed again. I said, please, dear God, if there's one single person sitting out there today who's never been born again, please, dear God, speak to them today so that today can be their day of salvation.